Hello and welcome. Um, as you enter the room, please put your name and affiliation in the chat box so folks can know who all is here and joining us today. We'll get started in just a moment. Thank you all for joining us today. We're excited to uh, start off our, our webinar series, Building a Resilient Georgia, with a conversation on funding opportunities. As you join into our webinar today, please put your name and affiliation in the chat box so that folks know uh, who all is here and where you're joining us from. I wanna go ahead and thank all the participants and speakers who've joined us today. My name is Lindy Betzold with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management and Linker Technologies. I will be your moderator for today's session. This webinar seeks to understand, uh, seeks to build understanding of new and emerging funding opportunities for resilience and those that also that have stood the test of time. We'll be focusing on federal and state funding opportunities. And in future conversations, we'll be touching on resources for applicants, technical assistance, and an opportunity to connect across the state to discuss priorities at the statewide, regional, and local levels. Today, we have, uh, we're here in the welcome and introduction, and then we'll jump right into the federal funding opportunities with uh, representatives from, uh, from, from GEMA, representing FEMA and GEMA, uh, with uh, REPI, the National Coastal Resilience Fund, the NOAA Restoration Center, and the Coastal Conservation Grant Program. After that, we have a presentation on Justice 40, and then we dive into state funding opportunities, including the coastal incentive grants, the 319 grants and GIFA funding. So uh, follow that, following that, we'll wrap up and have some next steps. To help me introduce this webinar series, I'll pass it over to Jill Gamble with Georgia Sea Grant for more information. Jill? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Gamble. I am um, the uh, Coastal Resilience Specialist for University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. Um, and thank you all so much for, for joining us. Let's see. So you can see all of our, our speakers. Hopefully now you're able to see everyone. So this, this webinar came out of conversations through the Georgia Coastal Hazards Community of Practice, which is a group of um, specialists who look at coastal hazards and work on that as part of their jobs. Uh, stemming from state and federal agencies, uh, nonprofits, academics, um, and other uh, private sector partners. We all uh, work together to share information, try to coordinate on projects so that we're not duplicating efforts, and um, really lift up the best practices as we're working in communities in coastal Georgia. And we've been noticing all of these federal funding opportunities coming down and um, are trying to help our communities here in the state uh, be poised to access them, to build capacity so that they'll be competitive um, and implementing um, the many needs that we have for updating our infrastructure, for utilizing green infrastructure and, um, and just trying to make our communities more equitable and resilient. Um, and so today is the first step in just starting to lay out the different funding opportunities that are on our radar share them with all of you. We hope to uh, move on from this and um, actually build more of an interactive discussion in the next phase, uh, whether it's an in-person or webinar format, um, where we can really do, build partnerships in trying to uh, submit some of these funding applications. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And I will hand it back over to Lindy with that. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much, Jill. Let's dive right into the federal funding opportunities. We have, uh, we have asked all the speakers, uh, both state and federal, that are speaking about funding opportunities to cover the types of projects that can be funded, examples in Georgia, uh, those, those entities that are eligible, match requirements, funding levels, application timing versus timing of award, geographic reach, and a number of other um, and other categories, including a POC for follow-up. So should you have additional uh, questions for our speakers today, feel free to follow up 
with the information that will be provided. Our first speaker up is uh, Jack Kurlikowski with GEMA, and I will pass it over to you, Jack, to share your screen. If I may, ask all of our other speakers to go on mute. And all right, is everyone able to see my slides and hear me okay? Yes, you're loud and clear. Thanks, Jack. All right, thank you. And, and thanks to uh, you know the group for, for having us here. Uh, again, my name is Jack Krolikowski. I'm here uh, representing the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency. So I wanted to share a little bit about um, our agency's uh, mission and vision. It's a little bit longer than that, but it really boils down to protection of, of life and, and, and property. And our department in particular, the Hazard Mitigation Department, is all about risk reduction. So we're trying to reduce risk for those, those lives and properties, particularly through the lens of, of natural hazards. And so I do want to pause there really quick, since we do use the word mitigation in, in our department's title, I just want to be really clear, particularly um, folks who might have more of a, a, a greenhouse gas um, sort of mandate in, in their work in terms of uh, emissions reduction. So when we're talking about mitigation uh, in my uh, portion of the presentation today, you, you could really think about it as adaptation, right? So we're, we're not really talking about a reduction in greenhouse gases, nor are we talking about um, wetland mitigation or things like, things like that. We're really talking about adaptation for the built environment. So since we're talking about um, risk reduction, I think it's important for us to think about what that really means. And so I, I want to kind of focus on that Venn diagram that we have there on the slide. And so I think what's important for us is that we look at risk as the intersection of hazard exposure and vulnerability. That's to say that kind of historically, I think we just looked at hazards and we said, OK, we're we are subject to flooding. So let's build a wall or let's build a, a, a dam, a levee, whatever that that looks like. But the flooding, and I don't think this is um, too hard to convince a, a lot of the folks here uh, on the call, a flood, if you're talking about a river flood, for example, that's probably a good thing. If you're a waterfowl, if you're fish um, looking to spawn, that's probably a, a good thing, right? It becomes an issue when we start to have that exposure, right? When we're putting those people and places in the way. And so, you know, hazard and exposure, now we're starting to have some issues and where it can become really risky is when we have underlying vulnerability. So probably two ways of thinking about that vulnerability for our purposes at, at GEMA. So those are either vulnerabilities of the built environment. So do we have an asset that is aging, right? And so it's one that is not gonna perform as well against a given um, sort of level of hazard in terms of wind velocity, um, depth of flooding, all those type things. We could also be talking certainly about uh, vulnerability of, of the population, right? Are we talking about a particularly elderly population? Are we talking about a population English as a second language? And that that sort of equity lens will be something that I think we'll touch on throughout the, the uh, presentations today. But that's really something I think that's important to think about in, in this risk is what are the risks we're trying to address? We may be uh, addressing any of those three sort of circles of the Venn diagram. Really, what is important is the takeaway is, you know, I think um, we were set up in terms of talking about what are real critical pieces to keep in mind for eligibility. Big one here. This is about the cost effectiveness. And what's important to recognize is that we need to identify the difference between our pre and post sort of service delivery, service delivery, excuse me. Um, so we're trying to find this apples to apples comparison between how is the, the sort of the, the disaster risk profile before uh, the investment and after. Of course, we're going to reduce that, and we need to identify that as cost effective. I have a link here in the slides that refers to the FEMA community lifelines, and those are the, the elements you can see there. I think those are really important for us to, to think about since the funds that we're going to get into, the specific grants that our department manages, are from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And so when we look at those FEMA community lifelines, it really is about the service delivery of these critical elements that, as you can see there, food, water, and shelter, communications, transportation. If those services are interrupted for any significant period of time, obviously we're gonna have some significant quality of life issues at the community level. So what's in it for me, right? I think I'm on my fourth slide and I think one of the golden rules of uh, public speaking, right, is you're supposed to tell the audience what's in it for them. So uh, hopefully that, you know, this, this entire uh, webinar today has a lot of the what's in it for you because, um, we're talking about dollars that are available for you um, 
you know, local governments, certain funding sources for, for nonprofits. And so clearly there's this element of, of what's in it for you. So, so hopefully we've, we've got you uh, sort of hooked um, from that regard, but specifically the three grants that our department administers, those are referred to as the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, Flood Mitigation Assistance, and Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Again, these are all made available through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We at GEMA are referred to as an applicant for those funds. So we apply to FEMA and local governments and for certain grant programs, qualifying nonprofits are sub applicants to the state uh, to access those funds. So flood mitigation assistance, just wanted to start here. Um, this is all about insurable properties under the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, be happy to, to engage with some folks um, offline with regards to the National Flood Insurance Program. You can see that Hayden Blaze, the State National Flood Insurance Program coordinator, is, is with us today. And so the, the Department of Natural Resources Floodplain Management Unit, great resource uh, for the National Flood Insurance Program. We coordinate with them on these um, types of projects. Um, again, these are focused on insurable properties, be it commercial or um, residential, though primarily residential. There's actually a funding opportunity that is open right now. You can see that link for the fiscal year uh, 21 notice of funding opportunity. So that, that link is, is live. Um, before I go much further into details, you know, I, I sort of want to share with everyone. We are, I am going to be getting into some, some nitty gritty details on the different funding sources, but I would love your takeaway to be to reach out to to our department if you if you have a project and, and you're saying hey is this funding source better is that funding source better the best thing you can do is sort of reach out early and often and then we can work together to make an informed decision so a particularly um relevant piece of that uh, is the third uh line there where you see there's some personally identifiable information associated with these grants namely to prior loss history under the national flood insurance program that is claims against the program and then the fact that that the sort of beneficiary is a policyholder and so since that is personally identifiable information that much more do we need to focus on um, timely communication so that we can make sure that we're handling that in appropriate way the next grant that i want to share on is the building resilient infrastructure and communities it's gotten a great deal of publicity as of late it comes out of 2018 legislation so it's gone through one round of funding uh, you can see some of the guiding principles and emphasized elements there. We're talking large community projects. Uh, I think something that will resonate with the group here is the, 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 um, uh, an emphasis on nature-based solutions, something very interesting, as well as future conditions. Um, similarly, you can see a link there to the fiscal year 21 notice of funding opportunity. That's available now. I have a summary slide closer to the end that will give you sort of all of the um, sort of the screen capture um, nuts and bolts, um, but sort of big picture here, you can see some of the emphasized elements, again, guiding principles of the building resilient infrastructure and community. Right. So I wanted to share a little bit about that nature-based solutions piece, just recognizing sort of this audience um, that obviously that's something that's that's very um, interesting, to, I think, to those of us who are, are used to practicing in, in the coastal environment. But I think we have some expectation management there because um, the program does, again, sort of emphasize those approaches but to, to come back to our cost effectiveness piece that we touched on earlier, these are funding sources through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And so despite all these co-benefits that we see here, which um, sort of conceptually and qualitatively, we will certainly build into the application development as support for why this is the approach we're taking. But for the cost effectiveness, which is, is we you know, think back on the, on the second slide, I believe, that's a programmatic requirement. And that's really going to be primarily focused on this disaster risk reduction piece. So as we, as we sort of think about that, so we're looking at how this disaster risk reduction, how this nature-based solution is going to intersect with some of those community lifelines that we touched on earlier. So I just want to sort of manage that expectation. It's not to say in any ways I want to discourage folks coming up with a nature-based solution. By no means, we are, we are totally on board with that, we, we, we would love, particularly the partnerships and the unique groups that can come together so as to promote a nature-based solution. But we do have a programmatic requirement that is going to be re really focused on that service delivery disaster risk reduction piece, as opposed to some of those co-benefits that may be in fact what we're most passionate about. So the good, the bad, and the ugly of fiscal year 20 for um, building zone infrastructure and communities. Um, 
lots of money went out the door. You know, I want to give um, credit where credit is due to our federal partners at FEMA. Um, as you may have noticed during Lindy's introduction, this is really the federal funding portion. Uh, though I am a state employee, we, we clearly work very closely um, with FEMA on that. So I you know, want to really acknowledge the fact that they were able to get quite a bit of money out the door. That said, on the second bullet point, I think that's a, a place where uh, if we reflect sort of as an industry, uh, you know, we, we didn't have a great uptake in terms of these were hyper competitive in terms of 22 out of 500 sub applications being accepted. And so similarly on the expectation management side, um, there is a great deal of money available. We'll see that in the summary slide, but extremely competitive. That's not good nor bad. It's just sort of the reality of if I'm a local government, what am I getting myself into knowing that I have limited resources and time to uh, you know, pursue all these various funding opportunities we're gonna to discuss today. Um, last two bullet points there, there were some dollars that, that came into Georgia. A lot of those were through a state set aside. So that's a, an allocation for us to prioritize some projects within the state, as well as the flood mitigation assistance um, grant, which we highlighted earlier. So we're definitely proud of close to a million dollars coming into the state uh, via that program as well. Brick and nature-based solutions, excuse me, um, I had that slide out of order, it looks like. Touch on the building codes piece for brick. Um, I, I used this terminology er earlier in terms of the state is the applicant. So we're in pretty good shape on the state building code due to the fact that we have the 2018 um, international codes. So that qualifies all of the sub applicants in the state for um, those points of the evaluation criteria. But local governments, um, please follow uh, up on me, uh, follow up with me, excuse me on this, but the building code affecting this grading schedule, this has to do with your local building code operations. And so I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with that, maybe if you work in the stormwater department and you're not quite so sure about the, the chief building official and what that might look like, we'd be happy to um, sort of engage in that conversation, but would encourage you to do so as well. Brick and future conditions, one of those other emphasized elements, um, similar to the to the earlier Venn diagram. I don't, you know, when we hear future conditions, I don't want um, anyone to think that it, there's any dampening on or, or you know reduction in focus on climate change. Right, climate change is is far and away probably the the future condition of most relevance. But there's other pieces in terms of development and demographics that are also important. So it's not an either or, it's really a, an and, an and, an and in terms of future conditions reflecting climate development and demographics. Hazard mitigation grant program, this is the one that folks may be most familiar with. This is what's triggered by a presidential uh, declaration. So this is through the Stafford Act. Um, this link similarly is live, that's to take you to our website. Probably the most important slide, um, and this is the one that uh, I believe all the slides will be made available, but in terms of kind of screenshotting or um, anything, this is really the most important information I think that Lindy got at earlier in terms of what's important. And so we can see this availability, current funding, um, competition, right? So the building resilient infrastructure and communities and flood mitigation assistance, those are nationwide competitions versus the hazard mitigation grant program, which is statewide. Um, Another element to, to point out there for the eligible sub applicants, um, the, those qualifying private nonprofits are limited to the hazard mitigation grant program. Typically the nonprofits that we engage with, with are um, sort of health and rehabilitation centers. That's probably the, the biggest customer, if you will, from the private nonprofit space. Um, you can see the cost shares there, maximum awards, grant deadline, obviously a very important one here. Last week of January, those are applications to FEMA for flood mitigation assistance and building resilient infrastructure and communities for purposes of getting that information to GEMA, we'd be looking at December the 15th. Um, application review and administration, these are important pieces as well that I want to cover. Fairly lengthy application review, just want to be fair in terms of those expectation managements, uh, sort of angle on things with folks. And then reimbursement here, so no physical work can take place prior to award. Try to be mindful of time here. Next steps, pre-applications are the first step. Those are available on our website. Please feel free to check those out via that link. They can be um, you know, turned in at any time. We take applications on a rolling basis and we will make that informed sort of uh, consultation with you as to timeline, funding source, what makes the most sense for you. Eligible activities, you can see them here. These can be community scale. These can be sort of limited asset scale in terms of drainage infrastructure. Web 
wastewater, drinking water, um, really anything and anything. I would rather have you all reach out and we can engage on the conversation as opposed to you trying to say, hey, um, maybe we shouldn't even reach out to GEMA because it won't make sense, right? We've been known as generator folks for a long time. We can really do a lot more than that in the uh, service delivery space at the community level. Last but not least, contact information. Here it is. Um, you know, please just copy down Krolikowski. I know, uh, I know it's a tough one. Folks tend to actually give me too many letters. I say, I'm good. I already have 11. I don't need any more. Um, but thank you all for your attention. Look forward to hearing from everybody else, answering any questions. Please shoot me an email. Be glad to uh, either engage now or as time allows um, over, the, over the coming uh, days or hours as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Right on time and uh, a giant amount of information that you just shared with us. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to also mention, as you have questions for our speakers, please put those in, a ch in the chat box. We will have time for question and answer after all of the speakers have gone. Um, so next up, we have Michelle Covey with uh, Sea Grant and Surpass, who's gonna share a bit of information about the REPI program. Michelle, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for including me. Uh, my name is Michelle Covey, and I am the Sea Grant Coastal Resilience DoD Liaison. I started in this new position in September at the University of Georgia Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant, and my position is supported through a unique collaboration with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense um, and Sea Grant. I am working to connect Sea Grant expertise, particularly in coastal resilience, with military communities, with a focus on the Southeast region. I work closely with the DOD REPI program, and that stands for Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration, which has an emphasis on climate resilience in recent years and has an opportunity open now that can assist communities in their resilience efforts. REPI was developed in response to a need that arose as military installations, which were formerly in remote areas, started to see changes in the landscape. In many areas in the Southeast, places that were formerly agricultural or forestry lands started to develop into residential areas or site tall structures such as wind turbines or cell phone towers that could interfere with training missions. Installations also received complaints from neighbors about noise or smoke from training or management activities. In addition, a loss of habitat for threatened or endangered species off base puts a greater pressure on their management on base, uh, which can limit uh, military missions as well. So uh, to better sustain missions and work with communities connected to bases, uh, DOD has developed several complementary programs as well as REPI that support uh, mission sustainability through compatible use planning and community coordination. Uh, REPI is not a grant program or a real estate acquisition program, but a cost sharing partnership program that helps partners to acquire easements from willing landowners or to develop resilience projects, uh, which we're talking about here, such as living shorelines or stormwater management on property outside the installation. So the opportunity that's open now is the REPI challenge. Uh, traditionally, the REPI program works directly through the installations and their partners, but the REPI challenge program funds non-DOD partners who develop innovative solutions that protect mission readiness in a way that traditional conservation easements may not. Uh, the uh, installation resilience justification was added just recently in fiscal year 19 National Defense Authorization Act. And in the last few years, climate resilience has been of particular interest uh, to DOD and the REPI program. For the 2022 REPI challenge, uh, there is $40 million available and 25 million of that is allocated to climate resilience projects. Uh, rep resilience projects that could be funded include planning, design, and implementation of um, structures like living shorelines, uh, stormwater improvements, erosion control projects, particularly those using nature-based techniques. Uh, any state or local government or nonprofit entity 
whose organizational purpose is conservation, restoration, or preservation of land and natural resources, is encouraged to apply in, in consultation with their uh, military installation that they are nearby. In developing a REPI Challenge project, uh, partnerships are key. Highly evaluated projects will leverage other state and federal and not-for-profit resilience programs. A REPI Challenge does require a 50% match, but it can be paired with other non-DOD federal programs. So like the um, FEMA BRIC program that uh, Jack was just talking about, or the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Coastal Resilience Program that we're going to hear about next, um, those can be paired uh, with REPI and can be part of that 50% match. Um, multiple and diverse partners, innovation, innovative approaches that work with multiple levels of government are highly encouraged. Uh, Georgia applications may also receive priority when they align with the goals of another REPI supported program, uh, the Georgian Sentinel Landscape program, please contact me if you're interested in applying for this opportunity so I can give you more information about that program. Uh, the application process requires a pre-proposal and coordination with the appropriate military service personnel, and it's due in just a couple of weeks. Um, it does come around every year, uh, but if you're interested, you know, let me know so that, so that I can give you more information about that. George has been very successful in working with the REPI program with over 150,000 acres that have been protected from mission encroachment and for natural resources management. Partners of the Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay and Camden County received REPI Challenge Awards in 2019 and 2020. Two of the largest undeveloped tracts of coastal land in the state were protected through applications by those partners listed and will serve multiple resilience and natural uh, resource functions. Please let me know if you're interested in the REPI Challenge and want more information. Um, and there's my contact information for you. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate you sharing that information. And uh, next up, I am going to share with you a little bit about the National Coastal Resilience Fund. And let me share my screen real quickly. All right, so the National Coastal Resilience Fund is a program that works to improve both the resilience of coastal communities and the natural habitat surrounding that community. Uh, the function there is to lower the uh, flooding and inundation by restoring or expanding a natural ecosystem. And that benefit to the coastal community is absorbance of floodwaters and many other coastal hazards, which I'll address in just a moment. The competition is actually uh, run by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, or NIFWF, in partnership with NOAA. It's been funded uh, for the last four years. Uh, the last three have been around 30 or 33 million, depending on appropriations. And uh, we do anticipate that FY22, while, uh, while FY22 budget has not been passed yet, we do anticipate possibly elevated funding, but it's been funded around, uh, around 30 million. And uh, many of you are keyed into the passage of the infrastructure bill late last week um, that did have a line item for the National Coastal Resilience Fund to see an additional 492 million over five years. That's right. That is a whole lot more than what we have been uh, working with before. And um, we're super excited to be able to offer um, a higher funding level in future years for improvement of, uh, of natural areas and using nat natural solutions to help with hazard mitigation goals. Types of projects funded. Uh, and essentially these are projects that reduce the threats to communities from flooding and other climate related hazards, but they must also benefit the fish and wildlife and their habitat. So it has to have those dual benefits. Um, and one example there is restoring a salt marsh to protect an evacuation route, as well as expand juvenile fish nursery habitat or something along those lines. There are four phases that are funded under NCRF. 
and NIFWIF works to make this a bit of a pipeline of projects as well. Um, the focus in previous years has been on this final red rust colored category, this restoration, including post restoration monitoring, monitoring and really wanting to get projects on the ground and uh, implement, implemented projects. So over time, the pipeline has expanded to include um, preliminary site assessment, uh, final design and permitting, as well as restoration. And about three years ago, we, uh, we added that community capacity building and planning and quite a bit of work here. It really helps to have this uh, phased system to really help meet the community or organization where uh, where they are as far as ability to um, to move forward. If they already have prioritized projects, maybe there isn't as much emphasis on community capacity building and planning if they're ready to dive on into uh, some of the design and permitting items. Geographic scope, it is nationwide, including our outlying islands. And for Georgia, that looks like uh, this, this somewhat wonky shape file, which is based on the HUC-8 watersheds and adjacent low-lying areas. Match requirements, in the past, we've had a one-to-one -one non-federal match in our in-kind services. Um, this has, uh, there have accepted match waivers in certain circumstances where there's been um, a historically underrepresented uh, group or um, a demonstrable need for a match waiver. Uh, as the funding, um, rolls out and as there's an increased emphasis through Justice 40, which we'll hear about in hopefully in just a little while, um, a lot of the match requirements are being re-examined. So we may see some movement on that. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how we'll move forward with that into the future. Um, as you might imagine, a lot of these restoration projects have quite a large dollar sign attached to it, which can be a limitation for some communities that uh, would like to enhance their resilience using natural solutions. Eligible applicants, nonprofits, you can read the list here. Pretty much everybody but the federal government can apply. <laughs> So this is what the lineup looks like. And we expect this RFP in February, uh, late February, early March. And in the past, there's been a pre-proposal phase. Uh, there's been some discussion about whether this one will still have a pre-proposal phase, but there has been one in the past. And in May, those applicants are invited to submit uh, full proposals and it is by invite only. Uh, those full proposals are due in late June, and in November, uh, there is a notification of successful application. In fact, um, you'll be hearing quite soon about the FY21 group of, um, of projects that were successfully, uh, successfully funded very soon. A little bit about NCRF in Georgia. These are th the three projects that have been funded through the National Coastal Resilience Fund and they are all in the category of the community capacity building and planning uh, group. There's a, we have the Tybee looking at uh, ecological impacts in the back bay there. Uh, we have a group that's looking across Georgia, North Carolina and South Carolina for innovative design, and appro design approach to capacity building. And we have one that was just funded in Camden County last round as well. So, um, these, uh, the the B one was funded uh, and under the FY19 funds and the other two were FY20. I wanted to make a quick note here about the Emergency Coastal Resilience Fund as well. Uh, while this did not apply to Georgia and um, the next round will not, may, may not apply to Georgia either due to federally dis declared disasters. Uh, this is an avenue by which the federal government is, um, is spending disaster supplemental funds post event. And um, if heaven forbid, there is a federally declared disaster like a hurricane or, um, uh, or something along those lines, then uh, Georgia would be eligible for emergency coastal resilience funds should they be allocated through a disaster supplemental comes through the same kind of pipeline as the National Coastal Resilience Fund. So I thought it warranted it a mention. And with that, here's my email address for any follow-up. Right. And we'll stop sharing. 
All right, well then I'm going to pass it on over to Ian Rossiter. Ian is going to join us and talk a bit about the NOAA Restoration Center Resilience Funding Opportunities. Thanks, Ian. All right, can you all see my screen here? Yes, you're good to go. Oh, perfect. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ian Rossiter. I'm a Marine Habitat Resources Specialist here at the NOAA Restoration Center. And there we go. Uh, today, I'm going to kind of talk about three primary funding opportunities that we have with the Restoration Center. Our main one, our main annual awards program is our community-based restoration program. And this is a regular funding opportunity. And this is also a program through which we provide technical assistance for habitat, coastal habitat fisheries, coastal fisheries habitat restoration. And the main goal of this program is to recover and sustain marine fisheries and fish habitat. So whereas this is our annual program, we occasionally have these sort of one-off or special funding opportunities. One thing that we are anticipating right now, so this is kind of a caveated section, as we don't know as much information about the moment, is with uh, funding passing through the Restoration Center from the infrastructure bill or bills. And with this, we are anticipating that there will be projects, so there will be monies for uh, projects that are uh, fisheries-linked infrastructure type projects, but more information will be coming on that soon. And then the final program I want to mention here is our Damage Assessment, Remediation, and Restoration Program, or DARP. And through this program, we recover funds from polluters uh, using the natural resource damage assessment process, and then we then use those funds to complete compensatory restoration projects for the injured natural resources. Uh, there are, is an active NERDA case on the, um, on the coast of Brunswick, but uh, restoration is still always out there. But it's worth noting, just so you have that in the back of your mind. So the types of project projects that we fund, um, we are a nationwide program and all of our projects work to increase fisheries productivity by restoring fish habitat. We are with the NOAA Fisheries, so there will be that uh, link that you'll see to marine fisheries. So since 1992, we have provided over $750 million to implement over 3,000 coastal habitat restoration projects. And on the coast of Georgia, we funded projects and provided technical assistance for projects that include oyster restoration, living shoreline creation, tidal wetland restoration and enhancement, hydrologic reconnection, uh, fish passage restoration, environmental outreach and education, and habitat conservation. And with the CRP is typically funded somewhere between that $50,000 to $2 million per year and uh, per project, and that it's typically around like $200,000 per year. And this is, can be a one to a three year commitment, although that second and third year are always pending review. As far as the infrastructure funding, you know, that's still to be determined, but what we're anticipating is that this will operate similar to our CRP program, but with much larger numbers, likely more in the millions. Uh, and then with DARP, that's always going to be case dependent. As far as the geographic scope, Georgia is within our South Atlantic subregion, and um, as I kind of hinted to earlier, our projects must be li linked to marine fisheries, but there is a little bit of flexibility in that that you'll see within the examples that I provide. Um, as far as match requirements for CRP, yes, there are requirements. Um, this can be a little bit flexible, but it's often provided in kind, although cash is also looked upon favorably during our proposal review process. Um, for infrastructure, we imagine that operating similarly. And for DARP, there are no match requirements. And eligible applicants include governments, NGOs, academia. Within Georgia, there have been nine CRP projects funded, and those have averaged around 62,000 per year funding uh, level. Uh, so one example of a project that's maybe not quite as coastal, you may not think uh, about it being as linked to marine fisheries, but was our Chattahoochee River restoration project that we uh, collaborated on. And this was a fish passage type project uh, with the dam removal or dam removals uh, around Columbus there. And we partnered with the Columbus Consolidated Government. And we were able to justify this as a NOAA fisheries project because of the linked species there being striped bass and I believe also Alabama shad and American eel. And then another example of a more coastal project is our the Little St. Simons Island Living Shoreline Project, which NOAA provided a little under $28,000 towards that. And we worked with a number of partners uh, there on that. 
as far as application timing. Um, our next ERP funding opportunity is kind of pending. We're waiting to see how infrastructure sh uh, shakes out. Our staff that operates our CRP program will also be in charge of a lot of the infrastructure funding opportunities. So we're trying to make sure those are spaced out appropriately. We're expecting to have clear guidance early uh, 2022. And if you ever want any more information on different fisheries funding opportunities, you can go to this link, which I'll drop in the chat here in just a moment. As well, we have uh, an email list in which we can let you know about these fund, uh, funding opportunities as they become available. And also we always encourage you to just get in touch with us. If you have project ideas or questions, feel free to contact, contact us at any time. And my contact information is right there. And that's all. Thank you all so much for your time. Great, thank you so much, Ian. Great information. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please feel free to drop that in the chat box. And next up, um, we are going to um, have Nicole Adamy, who will be joining us today uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And she's gonna talk to us about the Coastal Conservation Grant Program. Um, you may have noticed in the agenda that we have, uh, have have passed over our Army Corps representative. He is having a little bit of difficulty joining, so we may have to have him join us just a little bit later, hopefully uh, right after Nicole. But Nicole, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. All right, let, let me share my screen here. All righty, can you see my screen? Yes, but it's not in presentation mode. Oh, especially thanks not. to Nicole, who is joining us from her vacation. So, <laughs> for your dedication there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and thank you for taking the time uh, to listen about National Coastal Wetland Grants. So, again, my name is Nicole Adamy. Um, I used to work with Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm now a contractor with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, one of my areas that I spend uh, quite a bit of time on is in the National Coastal Wetlands Conservation Grants Program. So just to, some quick background, uh, this, this program was established through the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection and, Restre and Restoration Act of 1990. And it's to fund the design and construction of coastal wetlands and restoration projects. It is supported by uh, excise taxes on fishing equipment and motorboat fuel. So it is a very stable source of funding and we get quite a bit of it every year. So depend doesn't matter with the administration or the economy, the, the funding there has been very stable over, over the, a very long period of time. So applicants are agencies designated by the governor of a coastal state. So for example, in Georgia, it's Georgia DNR and some other states, it's another fish and wildlife agency. Grants are up to a million dollars for coastal um, for coastal and Great Lakes states, as well as US territories. And funding is really targeted to protect, restore, and enhance coastal wetland ecosystems, as well as associated uplands. And the program really wants to focus on long-term conservation of coastal wetlands. And we define long-term conservation as anything greater than 20 years. So the funding averages at about 19 million a year, and that can fluctuate you know, around that number. This year, we had, I think, over $23 million to spend. The project applications are currently due at the end of June and applicants are notified the following January slash between January and March. It depends on when all the approvals go through headquarters, but we have our ranking meeting in the fall and we usually try to notify applicant, applicants uh, after the new year. There is a 25% required non-federal match and that can be in kind, cash or a combination thereof. And the match funding can be from the state, but more, more than likely, it's actually from a partner that works with the state to submit the application. And grants are in the form of reimbursement. So you, it's after the fact you get your money. Eligible projects mostly, well, 
they can include all the following. Although I will say that we do tend to get more acquisition projects funded than restoration, but I don't really have the exact data behind what percentage that is. So we fund acquisition. We also fund restoration of coastal wetlands or other declining wetland types. There's a restoration of maritime forests, which is a big deal because you definitely have those in Georgia. And we also fund a combination where money is being requested to not only purchase a property, but also restore it. And then we also do phase projects. So there's several in Georgia where they split the, um, they split the project up over several years and kept coming in and applying for projects over the years, asking for a million dollars at a time for the same uh, big footprint, but they, they split it up so they could get a million dollars for each phase. So the projects are ranked uh, on 13 criteria and the evaluation of these criteria, it, it, it does slightly favor protection um, or restoration of large intact wetlands. And there's some portion of the project that must be associated with the coastal wetland area to count for, um, to be eligible. Ranking criteria covers all of these factors. Most of the time, um, maritime forest is, is only in the Southeast. So that is the one we actually often get extra points on in the Southeast because we do have maritime forest that's not uh, in other areas of the US. And just to give you a quick uh, overview, so and Georgia in particular has been highly successful in recent years, I would say over the last seven or eight in acquiring national coastal wetland grants. And this is just to show you the lower Altamaha River corridor and some of the projects that have been funded with national coastal wetland grants. We have, we, uh, we were part of this Altama plantation, um, the Clayhole Swamp, uh, San Sevilla, we were in one stage of the San Sevilla, the uh, Morgan Lake, Boyles Island, um, Rayonier Phase One, and I think there was another one somewhere in here. But as you can see, there's a lot of funding sources, but this Coastal Wetlands Grants have been very successful um, in helping acquire land with Georgia DNR and their partners through this grant program. And Georgia DNR really has it locked in on how to do successful applications. And we've been working very closely with them over the last several years. So for more information, um, there's my contact information. My counterpart is Jim Duffy. And Jim sort of focuses more on the financial aspects of you know, closing costs and acquisition, due diligence information. Uh, matching information, and I really focus on the application itself, writing the application, and uh, providing guidance on how to improve the application for the ranking criteria. So please reach out if you have additional questions or information, and here is um, a source for more information regarding the grant program. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nicole. We do have Brian with us from Army Corps of Engineers. We are still working through a few remaining technological issues. So uh, we want to open it up for question and answer. Uh, looking at what's been put in the chat box thus far, um, one person was interested in getting the slides. Actually, several folks inquired about the slides for this. And I just wanted to let everyone know we will be distributing the slides along with the recording of the webinar to all registered participants, um, whether you were able to make it to the actual session or not. So look for that after our webinar wraps up for today. And we had another question about future funding opportunities in the recently passed infrastructure bill. I know I mentioned it and I know Ian mentioned it and um, uh, there will certainly be some opportunities. Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off and anyone else can jump in after this. There will certainly be some opportunities in the, in the infrastructure bill. There's quite a bit of um, of work in there on resilience and um, and infrastructure, clearly. And uh, we don't, since it was just past Friday, we don't really have our marching orders yet. Uh, it does take some time for um, the, the programs to be um, apprised of how exactly the executive branch wants these things to be rolled out. So um, 
we will absolutely be in touch with more information uh, to pretty much just about anybody who, who would be applying for these um, because we certainly want these uh, this large amount of, of uh, funding to go to excellent and valuable sources. So while we don't have any, uh, an answer necessarily on any new opportunities or changes to programs at this point, be on the lookout for um, for additional opportunities uh, related to the infrastructure bill. Ian, uh, Nicole, do you have anything to add? I was just going to say, I was typing it to somebody, Jim, that asked the question about homeowners associations. We do have um, we do have programs that work with private landowners, the partners program, as well as the coastal program. And um, and some of I think in the past we have funded homeowners associations for like restoration habitat. Um, all kinds of habitat improvements. So that will include restoration, enhancement, maintenance. The service is pretty focused on, on properties and projects that support federally listed and at-risk species in both of those programs. However, with that being said, um, the infrastructure bill, I think might open that up to a larger swath of, of coordination outside of maybe the complete focus on listed and at-risk species and most likely in, in some of our programs for the partners and coastal programs. I think um, I think you'll be hearing more about this as we get further guidance through the government on how that money is going to filter into our programs. I think we're going to get a lot of latitude, if I can say, in what we choose to fund um, as long as it's as long as it's uh, in line with the integrity and intent of the funding. But I think there's going to be some opportunities that we historically have not been able to fund that we will be able to look at um, across the board. And I'd just like to echo what's been said so far. Um, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly what's going to be going or um, how that will be handled, but we have been spending a good time talking about it and uh, we will have uh, be putting out information as soon as we have a better idea on our end of the restoration center. But if you do have any projects or uh, questions about that, please do get in touch. We'd love to talk to you about it. Great. Thank you. Anyone else of the federal speakers I would like to uh, elaborate on, on anything about the infrastructure bill? Okay, great. I think that that associate uh, that wraps up all the questions that we had in the chat. And um, Brian Choate from Army Corps of Engineers has joined us. Brian, thank you very much for working with all of our technology technology issues that, that we've had in the background. Hopefully it seemed seamless to our participants. Um, but Brian and Jill have been working hard to, uh, to get this presentation and Brian connected appropriately. So thank you very much to you both and um, Brian, I will pass it over to you. Your presentation is up and Jill is sharing her screen. Brian, if you're talking, we have you still on mute. You may need to uh, hit star six on your phone to unmute. Uh, that worked. It's, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Uh, so um, good afternoon. I'm Brian Shade. I'm plant formulator with the uh, Savannah District. Um, so thanks for bringing me in to discuss a few of these core partnering and funding opportunities. Uh, apologies for the uh, issues on, uh, on my end. So might not able to see you, but uh, hopefully we can get the point across. Um, I plan to discuss uh, uh, planning assistance to states, uh, floodplain management services, um, silver jackets, not as a funding opportunity, but a pathway to uh, uh, funding options. And if time permits, I may touch on just a couple of the ongoing CAP, uh, uh, continuing authorities program, CAP studies that we have, just in case there is someone on the line that's not familiar with those. Next slide. Okay, with regards to Savannah District, uh, you can see the map. These are our boundaries. Uh, primarily, uh, we've got a regulatory boundary that, of course, is the, the state of Georgia. Uh, the Civil Works boundary, uh, we go a little bit into uh, South Carolina as well as portions of Georgia. Uh, 
We also have Charleston to the north that helps us out, as well as Jacksonville, Mobile to the, the south and the southwest. Um, but keep in mind, we can you can we can leverage each other and uh, broker different projects as well. So if it's something that may look like it's outside of this uh, this district boundary, um, and also uh, just want to touch on uh, uh, just keep in mind that uh, with the new administration and the new infrastructure bill that's coming forward. Uh, there'll be a lot of focus on economically disadvantaged and underserved uh, communities. So that, that'll be a key pathway to funding opportunities. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, planning assistance to state, uh, the PAS program, the Corps can prepare plans for development, utiliz utilization and conservation of water and water related uh, resource rent as well as land resources located in the boundaries of the state. Uh, the Corps can only provide conceptual designs, uh, sponsor eligibility, uh, the state, U.S. territories, the federally recognized tribes and NGOs. Uh, with regards to the, the tribes, there is a $482,000 cost waiver. Uh, study types, any water or water related resources, uh, typically, these include uh, watershed planning, GIS mapping, uh, water sewer, uh, storm maps, H and H modeling, uh, shoreline protection, et cetera. Um, so, basically, if it's water, water related, we can probably help you out with it. Uh, current projects, Lake Beatrice, uh, that's a dam safety evaluation and proposed improvements project. Uh, Tidy Island ship induced wave analysis. We're looking at uh, to determine if there's the existence or the degree of which ships are inducing uh, some wave action damages at Tybee Island, North Beach. Uh, and Pool Creek, which is a project where we're working with the city of Atlanta to identify long-term solutions that uh, the city can implement to support their ongoing efforts to reduce uh, flooding uh, along Hutchins Road um, southeast. And that's a federal share of 50%. Uh, but it's important to note that the non-federal share or non-federal sponsor share can be 100% work in kind. Um, and of course, that's that's just basically typically engineers going back and forth with the sponsor to say, you know, we can use this or that, those types of questions that get answered for the work in kind. Um, and for example, uh, Pool Creek, uh, what we're looking at there is uh, flow constriction, a bridge crossing down trees, collecting debris and causing obstruction in the creek uh, and sediment deposition within the creek as well as in the, uh, the drain network. Next slide. So with regards to plan assistance to states, uh, it's a request process. Uh, it's a non-federal letter, letter of intent. Um, and basically that's uh, the name of the entity, uh, city, county, state, description of the project, uh, or I'm sorry, the problem or assistance required. Uh, letter of agreement, and that, that's worked with the district. It's typically a cost share agreement. Uh, we'll produce the scope of work, a cost estimate, and the schedule. Um, the sponsor and the district will sign that letter of agreement. And then once funds are received, we anticipate execution within 18 months. So it's a fairly quick process with regards to uh, the core and federal government in general. Uh, next slide. Uh, transition over to floodplain management services, FPMS. Uh, this is a technical assistance program primarily to identify the magnitude of flood hazards. Uh, also proper use of floodplains. Um, ultimately what we're looking at is um, uh, fostering a better understanding with the public and reducing uh, or preventing the loss of life and reducing property damages. This is up to 100% federally funded. Um, some of the projects that uh, we currently have going on are flood damage assessments, uh, looking at flooding below uh, J. Strom Thurman, for example, based off uh, flows from the dam um, and how we can communicate those risks and benefits to the communities. Uh, flood inundation mapping, we do uh, quite a few of those as of late. Uh, at uh, probably four or five that we've just closed or in the process of working uh, to completion. Um, next slide. Um, oh, and just real quick before I move to the, the silver jackets, the, uh, with regards to the FPMS, uh, this is likely going to be the funding that's most specifically directed towards economically disadvantaged and underserved communities. 
Uh, so if you have, uh, if anyone on the line has, uh, you know, some of that data as far as the community information, specific areas where uh, you've identified such uh, communities, uh, then that would be great if you could send that over and we can coordinate that with our uh, Silver Jackets team and kind of coordinate projects uh, together and accordingly. Um, so with Silver Jackets, it's not a it's not a funding opportunity per se. It's more of a one stop shop for city and county government. Uh, as you've uh, heard from Jack already uh, a little bit earlier today, he's he's kind of taken over as our our state representative, uh, leading these uh, these meetings, and it's been much more productive uh, since he's come aboard. Um, and what what we basically do is we leverage uh, the resources of various agencies, different agencies are bringing different ways to the game. Uh, we look at that talent, data, and funding, uh, and we work together to uh, prioritize where we can uh, better focus our efforts with regards to um, identifying areas in the state that are at risk of flooding and assist communities in reducing that risk. Uh, next slide. So this slide just shows a few of the things this, uh, that the Silver Jackets can do for our uh, partners. Um, and uh, basically, it's just like I previously mentioned, it's different fields of expertise. Uh, and the, the more diverse we are getting in the room together, then, you know, we can kind of come up with some good solutions. Um, so, again, that's a one-stop shop for assisting flood risk and reducing damages. Um, uh, next slide. So, uh, closing it out, I know that was uh, that was fairly quick and also it was, you know, we had some technology issues. Uh, so um, uh, many of you know Jeff Morris, uh, he's actually he just stepped in, he's listening in. Uh, myself, Brian Schott, you can speak, uh, you can reach out to either one of us or both of us for any sort of questions with regards to any of these funding opportunities. Uh, as far as CAP specific, you can also reach out to us and we'll get you in, in, uh, in touch with Jeff Swindeman, who's, uh, who handles our program here at the Savannah District. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over with questions. Great, thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate you navigating the technology issues and for a great presentation. Um, I think we have answered all the questions so far that folks have put in the chat box. Does we have time for a, a question or two before our next speaker? If anyone has any items, I'll just pause for just a moment. Okay, unless something comes up in the chat box, we will move along. Um, next up, we have Christina Cummings, who is with the Partnership for Southern Equity, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Justice 40, the guidelines, and how it could change applications and projects for existing funding opportunities. So Justice 40 is the whole of government effort to ensure that federal agencies are delivering at least 40% of overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. Um, Christina is coming to us from the Partnership for Southern Equity, and she um, is going to share with us a bit about the Justice 40 effort itself, as well as the Justice 40 accelerator effort that she is a, uh, that her group is a partner in. Um, the, the, as you've heard from many of our federal speakers, there is absolutely a focus on underserved and historically underrepresented communities. And in the conversation that initially that Jill alluded to in the introduction um, regarding Georgia wanting to have a, a um, a solid approach for these funding opportunities, Georgia wanted to send, spend some time thinking about how to support underserved communities to be able to apply for funding and enhance their resilience in advance of this opportunity. So with that, I will pass it over to Christina. Welcome, Christina. So very much for that very warm introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Cummings. I serve as the Vice President of Operations for the Partnership for Southern Equity. Um, I apologize for not having a snazzy um, PowerPoint, um, but hopefully I'll be able to kind of um, talk a little bit about our work at the Partnership for Southern Equity and how it relates to the Justice 40 Excel. Accelerator. 
So just a little bit of context and backstory. Um, when the announcement came down via executive order that the Biden-Harris administration was going to make sure that 40% of the investments um, would go to frontline communities, we realized immediately that there was going to be a gap. There was going to be a gap in knowledge. There was going to be a gap in resources. And how did we? How could we create um, a, a, a response to a, a potential problem to ready frontline communities? And so, what we have really thought about is when we created the Justice Forty Accelerator, is how do we listen to communities and fund and work cross collaboratively um, with our partners to, to really stand up and posture communities for, for this unprecedented opportunity. So the mission of the Partnership for Southern Equity is that we advance policies and institutional actions that promote racial equity and share prosperity for all in the growth of Atlanta and the American South. We work across four primary issue areas that include just energy, just growth, which is our land use um, portfolio. We work at the intersection of just opportunity and economic inclusion and racial equity and health through our just health portfolio. And so kind of grounded in our theory of change of how we work, um, we call um, it the PSC way. And so it's really around transforming systems and transforming people. And so our theory of change is anchored in making sure that the work we do, we lead with race, we catalyze relationships, we build an equity ecosystem. We always ground our work in communities of color and low wealth. And we always lead and anchor our work in data and research. And so for this conversation, I think it's important to understand how we talk about racial equity and what we mean as, as we define that. We define racial equity as a reality in which a person is no more or less likely to experience society's benefits or burdens just because of the color of their skin. And when we think about energy equity, we're thinking we're defining that as the fair distribution of benefits and burdens of our energy production and consumption. And so if I were showing you a PowerPoint slide, it would um, actually have this graphic around the, the differences between what does equality look like? What does equity look like? What is the current context and reality um, that, that people face? And then what does liberation look like? What does it look like when we work to remove the barriers so that people can participate fully? Um, and so I'll fast forward a little bit to our work around the Justice 40 Accelerator. And so it was conceived as a nonprofit and social enterprise collaborations across Partnership for Southern Equity, Elevate, Groundswell, the Solutions Project, and the Hummingbird Firm. And so the, as Lindy mentioned, the Justice 40 initiative um, directs 40% of benefits. And so I'm gonna hone in on the word benefits because that hasn't been clearly defined about what that actually means um, of the administration's investments in clean energy and climate into disadvantaged communities. And so this would represent an historic opportunity to result in funding across energy, water, waste mitigation, housing, transportation, and local business development. And so what I think is so different and so unique about the way that we conceptualize and design the Justice 40 Accelerator is really our vision is that we came together as organizations that were anchored in a shared vision. And so our vision for the Accelerator is that we are anchored in love, service and a sincere commitment to frontline communities. The Justice 40 Accelerator seeks to leverage this moment to radically reimagine the existing government resource delivery system as something that is reparative and restorative framework that better supports black and historically disinvested communities of color. And so why that is so important is because we, 
we named race and, and disinvested communities of color at the center of how we wanted to curate this experience. And so we really had a three step strategy and that was our action. How could we better prepare frontline communities to win, to build their contracting and their procurement muscle and become more competitive for federal um, funding opportunities? How could we influence and map the systems of barriers to access? How could we use both quantitative and qualitative data to really tell a story about how and why people get shut out of the process? And then transformation, how do we educate and engage with lawmakers and decision makers to have everlasting change? And so across our, I guess, methodology, the way we set up the accelerator was to, we had a series of about um, maybe 18 listening sessions and workshops to really talk about what the accelerator is. And it is separate from federal government. We privately set a goal initially to raise about $3 million to forward the work of the Justice 40 Accelerator. Um, to date, we've raised about $9 million to forward that work. Um, and it has been invested in through the philanthropic community from organizations like JPB, um, the, the Packard Fund, um, the Bezos Earth Fund made a significant investment, um, Kresge Foundation, and so other philanthropic organizations are starting to help us um, posture and stand up this work. So we did an application round over the summer and it's a national program. We enlisted and got over 320 applications across the nation. Uh, we narrowed that down to what was our first cohort because at the time we only had about a little shy of $3 million um, to deploy. And so we wanted to, you know, take it in bite-sized chunks. And so we set up the program so that each organization would get a $25,000 pre-development grant in addition to very tailored and curated um, technical assistance and one-on-one -on -one support. So we just finished our round of one-on-ones with all of our um, accelerator participants. We're getting to know their projects. We're getting to understand, you know, what agencies they are um, interested in applying for. We've um, launched our website where we've tried to aggregate the data in real time about opportunities that are available. Um, and now we're starting to program our workshops with, you know, officials from different areas of the government. We had Dr. Shalanda Baker from the Department of Energy do a, a session, um, Jahi Wise did a session with our cohort. And so two main things have really risen um, to the top as we've been doing our listening around the cohorts. The technical assistance is great and they need technical assistance, but the frontline communities have been very clear that they also need money um, in order to implement against um, programs and, and develop projects and just, you know, thinking about the fact that if you're going to compete for federal funding, you're going to need a, a financial audit that can cost a small agency about $10,000 just to get ready um, to be able to apply. And if you're a well-resourced organization, we've kind of done the calculations that it takes a well-resourced organization about 120 to 150 hours to apply for federal funding. And so that can be a real barrier to access if you're trying to you know, um, access these funds. And so um, just a little bit about kind of our model and then I will pause um, and, and take questions. We developed it kind of as a circle that kind of bubbled out where we had our core team of partners, which was Groundswell, Hummingbird, PSC Solutions Project, and um, Elevate. And then we had another rung of what our funders would look like. And then we have a process where we are working to enlist the support of technical advisors and technical experts to help be navigators for our cohort members and really walk alongside them 
as they develop their application. So what does it look like when you have paid professional help to help you navigate your um, your application for, for HUD if you're trying to get community development block grant funds or what does it look like if you're trying to get funds from EPA, um, USDA. So all of those applications are very nuanced. And so we're trying to resource that and then we're also thinking about kind of unanticipated consequences of what does it look like um, to be able to, um, to actually do business with the government. So what's the best role for an organization um, to access funding? Should you be a prime? Should you be a subrecipient, Or should you just be a vendor on a contract? And so we're really helping our cohort members really dig deep and figure out um, what that looks like. I'm looking at a question that Jill put in the chat. Is there a second cohort of the accelerator? And if so, what is the application process? That's a great question. So we got so many great applications the first round. We, we had the first cohort at 52, but we had 64 additional projects that we felt like were great and fundable projects. And so they will make up cohort number two and will likely be onboarded in um, like January or February of FY22. And then we will open up a third round of applications in the summer um, for Justice 40 Accelerator. And so that was a really great question. And so some of the, you know, offerings and support I went through was, you know, the money, of course, is, is helpful, but $25,000 is not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but it could just help. Um, we're also, you know, providing some some data support and some research capacity and support around how to develop. Um, we're part of partnership for Southern Equity Scope is we're developing like a GIS story map that we're dropping all of these projects on and hopefully we'll be able to build out and develop policy briefs in those various jurisdictions so that we can go to um, the representatives of those areas and say, hey, if you're having problems getting your money out the door, here are some viable options and some viable projects for you to consider. Um, and so with that, I want to just put in the chat, um, I'll put in the chat the justice40accelerator.org website. Um, and then I will open it up for questions if anybody has any questions. And then I will also put my contact information um, in the chat as well and how you can kind of follow and keep up with our work. And I'm sorry, I love to make pretty PowerPoint presentations. And so I just was pulled in a lot of different directions today. And so I couldn't pull it together. But thank you so much for sharing space and time for me. You did fantastic, Christina, and thank you so much for all um, all your effort to help um, showcase this innovative approach to uh, to justice and funding. Um, I had a one question for you, and if there are any other questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, are the original cohort members eligible for any follow up funding, or is the focus just on getting those cohorts started? I know it's a it's a newer effort, but wondering how so that goes. So yeah, so we're like thinking through all of the things that have to happen. And so when we approached the project initially, it was like, okay, well, how do you design this thing um, and stand it up? And so we realized that there's some gaps. Um, ultimately, some funding requires match. And so because when we went wrote the grant applications, we you know had a very discreet and defined way that we asked for dollars. And so as we're delivering against the, the program now would be a good time. We're kind of doing our evaluation and feedback loop to go back to our funders to say, hey, as we're you know in this process, we realize that we may need to establish a fund that should help um, our frontline organizations access matching funds, or you know we should have you know some some dollars there that they can actually tap into. And so all of those things are on the table um, because we know that those 
obstacles or real barriers um, to access. But at the baseline, the program was, how do we get everybody $25,000? How do we get them these additional supports and these additional resources, whether that's grant writers or legal support or an accountant to actually look at your financial um, books and how you put your how you how you assemble your package and your documents and so um, we're we're trying to figure this all out as we're doing it at the same time but it's very exciting um, because it gives us the opportunity to dream a little and to if the federal government were to do this work well and we were to coordinate at all levels of government from the federal to the state to the counties to the cities um, we could really use this money and these investments to repair um, and heal a lot of communities that could be negatively um, impacted by, um, by the acceleration and the injection of such large sums of money if you're not careful with how you do that. That makes sense. And that, uh, you've used your creativity to develop a very, uh, very robust model that can be used for other, uh, you, you know, your organization focuses on nonprofits. It can be used for, like you mentioned, municipal governments and other sorts of um, other sorts of groups. We have a question from the audience that says, um, when you say disadvantaged communities, are these local governments or does this include NGOs and private businesses? Oh, I might have uh, stolen your thunder there a little bit. I'm sorry about that, Christina. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. I think that that's part of the the, the vagueness of the definition of how the policy is written. I know um, I come from the world of HUD. Um, and so we have a very discreet definition that if income in a particular area or a census tract falls below 80% of the area median income, then that's considered a disadvantaged census tract or a LMI, a low to moderate income community. And so while I'm assuming that that is how the language is being applied, it is very vague. And that's one of the, the um, things that we've been asking and, and working with our partners at the federal government to really help us define and get clarity around what that looks like. Um, for our accelerator, we only opened it up for NGOs and for cooperatives in this round because we were trying to get our feet under us and really figure out what we were doing. Um, and then going forward, it could be, but we knew that we weren't we weren't trying to solve everything for everybody. So like that's a whole nother body of work if you're going to do work with NGOs or, or if you're going to do work with like local government. And we felt like agencies like the Georgia Municipal Association or the National League of Cities and organizations like that are probably better postured um, to help deploy information into those municipal governments so that they can operationalize through their procurement processes and through their internal um, planning efforts. Because if you're going to spend a, a, a dollar of federal money, you still have the same compliance re regulation and red tape. If, if, even if it was a billion dollars, it's still the same compliance. And so um, we didn't feel like we were best prepared since we were nonprofit agencies. We kind of stayed in a safe space to, to work with the, the um um, target audience and a group that we felt like we could serve best. Great approach. Um, on this same topic, we actually have a question for Brian, um, if you'll come off mute. Uh, does Army Corps have a definition for economically disadvantaged communities or Silver Jackets engagement? Brian, if you're speaking, I think you're probably still on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we we don't have a specific definition, but uh, my expectation is that uh, we we probably will get that narrowed narrowed down a little bit. But uh, we have it uh, fairly broad. Um, it's uh, uh, our economist has basically it's a uh, it's a program they run. I don't know the specifics of it, but I can certainly. Uh, uh, get that information if someone is wanting to know uh, specifics of how that works. But 
it's all through uh, through our economics team. Great, thank you. And we had a follow up question that is um, that is also to Brian, um, and this one is on our previous uh, our previous topic of federal funding. So um, I will I will pass it on to you. Is the core shifting to nature based solutions, or maybe how is the core viewing nature based solutions in Savannah District? Uh, we are. We uh, we're actually got uh, a couple fairly large investigation studies where um, uh, basically it's uh, we, we've come to realize like with our um, our uh, section 1135 cap studies um, you know some previous uh, core projects uh, particularly uh, you know the 40s through the 60s there was a lot of altering of uh, waterways rivers off for navigation uh, so we've started um, uh, correcting those uh, mistakes or what we would be as mistakes today and uh, restoring those areas as far as um, like with Noah's Cut in Camden County, Georgia, uh, that was a partnership with uh, DNR and the Satilla Riverkeeper. And what it was was an obsolete navigation cut. Uh, so the, the project um, basically we had to work to deauthorize that because uh, any deauthorization has to, has to come from Congress. So once the authorized and the uh, the expectation was that it would uh, return to natural salinity gradient to the tidal creek and halt the shoaling issue that was uh, restricting access for aquatic species and anglers alike. Um, and also we have a Savannah River below Augusta. Uh, it's also a, a navigational cut project that we're looking at. And we've actually started pulling in uh, uh, our center of expertise uh, from out uh, in the Pacific Northwest who does a lot with log jams and uh, we're trying to, to see if that's going to be a viable option here on the Savannah River. Um, some of the models suggest it will. Uh, we're just trying to trying to hopefully move, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the construction business and, you know, it's always been uh, concrete and steel. So we're trying to trying to move away from that, not only for the nature, but just the, you know, the cost savings in general. Um, over. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate it. And Christina, thank you so much for a fantastic and engaging portrayal of the work that Justice 40 and the Southern uh, Partnership for Equity are, are doing, the Partnership for Southern Equity. Um, really excited about your work and um, for the, um, uh, the repercussions it could have for other sectors besides uh, nonprofit. Lots of different applications to take your lessons learned and apply them even brought more broadly to enhance equity. Thank you so very much. Thank you all for having me. I am going to run because my calendar is like triple booked at the two o'clock hour, but <laughs> I appreciate you all so much for just having me share. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank your participation. Bye-bye. You. Great. All right, we will shift into our state funding opportunities and um, I will pass it over to Jennifer Klein and Kelly Hill, who will be talking with us about the Coastal Incentive Grant Program, as well as opportunities to partner on EPA Clean Water Act 319 projects. Jennifer and Kelly. Hi, um, let's share screen. Okay. Oh no. Can you see my screen? We can, and now it is full screen. So you are all set. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Klein. I am the Coastal Hazard Specialist for Georgia DNR's Coastal Management Program. Um, I am um, not the grants coordinator. Um, but if you are a grants coordinator and you're looking for a job, I've got one for you. It's my shameless plug. Um, and you'll hear in a minute from my colleague, Kelly Hill, um, who is our green growth specialist. But I want to tell you a little bit about our Coastal Incentive Grant Program. Um, so the goal of our CIG program, um, obviously, is to support our mission, um, you know, to balance economic development um, while protecting our, our coastal resources. Um, our, our projects should address local and regional coastal resource protection, um, support research in areas of, you know, specific um, management needs, 
Um, and then they, your successful project should demonstrate these. Um, our eligible recipients um, have to be in these 11, um, focus on the 11 coastal counties. So our local governments, um, the counties or their jurisdictions within these 11 coastal counties. Um, state affiliated, affiliated research um, institutions, universities, um, projects that they are seeking for these 11 coastal counties. And then other um, regional um, entities and state agencies, except for DNR, are, are eligible for, to apply for these funds. Um, the types of proposals, um, we are, so I mentioned research, research as it relates to um, our coastal area planning, education and outreach, and some construction um, and acquisition projects as well. It does have to meet um, one of our five themes. Um, uh, they are uh, pretty broad, so most of the projects do fit into these themes. Um, oceans and wetlands, sustainable communities, um, disaster resiliency and coastal hazards, non-point source pollution, and public access and land conservation. Um, just a project idea, um, an example, we do um, a lot of planning proposals um, come in. It can be local planning, regional planning, um, different types of planning, like hazards types of planning, um, ordinance development, um, or even you know, um, implementation at the local level. Um, resource inventories, GIS mapping, um, those are just some examples. So um, the heart of the, the, the details that you probably wanna know, um, right now our projects, we will fund um, 80,000 per year for up to um, two years. Um, those tasks have to be um, different per year and um, they have to be matched one-to-one -one from non-federal sources. This is um, federal pass-through dollars that we would be, um, that the grant is. Um, our, we do have a web portal that we are accepting um, our applications. It's in this link here. Um, real quick turnaround if you want to apply. The pre-applications are due to us by 4.30 on Friday, December the 3rd. Um, the full applications, um, well, the whole project, all of the projects are competitive, but the full application would be um, by invitation only. Um, and those would be due to us um, by 4.30 on um, Friday, February 11th. Um, all of our applications um, will be notified um, by April preliminarily, um, and that is also contingent upon NOAA's approval of, of the projects. So Kelly? All right, thanks, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Kelly Hill, the Green Growth Specialist here at Coastal Resources Division of DNR. And I'll just quickly kind of hone in on one of the funding themes that Jennifer mentioned um, to highlight a potentially unique collaboration between our grant program and then um, these Section 319H non-point source implementation grants that are actually administered through our sister division at Environmental Protection Division. So while we don't implement this grant, I think it's a great source of funding to kind of take some of our projects to the next step where um, our CIGs wouldn't be an eligible funding source for that. So I'm just going to highlight a few examples and it might spur some interest and ideas for some um, nature-based stormwater management type projects. Um, under that non-point source theme, um, we've had quite a few projects that highlight planning initiatives. So um, our CIGs are a great opportunity to fund watershed management plans. And as you may know, if you're familiar with 319 funding, you must have an EPA nine element watershed management plan um, to be eligible for that funding source. And while they won't pay for that planning um, process, our CIG will. We've actually had some applicants um, most recently in Charlton County develop a nine element watershed management plan with our CIG funding. So now that puts them in a great position to go forward and apply for Section 319 funding to implement some of the BMPs identified in that plan. Um, our CIGs are also a great source of funding um, to do assessments of where potential green infrastructure or low impact development stormwater management practices could be 
um, put into practice based on GIS analysis and other assessments that are done in the watershed, um, or potentially the design and engineering plans for those practices. Um, that can be an expensive component of a project, getting through that design and engineering phase. So that's um, something that we really encourage applicants to use our funding for um, to get through those first initial steps and then move on to potentially um, an EPD Section 319 grant for the implementation phase. Um, again, I am with CRD and not EPD, but um, I did ask them to send the best contact information for that grant program. And Jennifer, if you'll go to the next slide. Yes, I apologize for all the text. I originally thought we only had five minutes, so I was going to flash this up there. But um, this is a website that you can go to, and it has all of the information that you can need to learn more about how to apply for EPD's um, non-point source project. Um, I'll just quickly highlight on some of their requirements that um, are all outlined as, um, in addition to some good contact information on there. But their, that main goal is to really reduce the pollutant loads and result in measurable water quality improvements to impaired waters. Um, the difference with our grant program and theirs is theirs is statewide. Um, they have to meet the minimum requirements of, like I mentioned, um, having an existing watershed management plan based on EPA's nine elements for watershed planning, focus within that 10 um, hot code size watershed, and their match requirement is 40% of the total project cost of non-federal match. <clears throat> Maximum award is much higher than our coastal incentive grants at 400,000 and their term is three years um, at the most. Um, here's kind of a description, I won't read this word for word of eligible projects, but like I said, it's a great funding source to take um, something that was designed or engineered through a coastal incentive grant into the implementation phase and fund that construction. Our coastal incentive grants are very limited in what they will fund under those 306A construction grants and typically, those stormwater and um, nature-based infrastructure practices are not eligible for the construction phase. So this is a great resource to kind of take that plan to the next level. Um, eligible applicants are very similar to our um, CIG grants as well. And their timeline's a little different um, where ours is coming out a little bit sooner in this fall. Their call for proposals is typically, last year it was released in January. And then in March, they have a required webinar that you attend and go through a draft application process um, in April, and then a final draft application, I can't see the bottom of my own slide, I believe is in June, and then throughout the summer, they notify applicants and go through that contracting and projects again in the fall. Um, but again, this is something that you should reach out to someone on this website to hear more about, but as a technical assistant with Coastal Resources Division, you know, we are available to help our local governments if they have project ideas and we can kind of talk to you about um, different opportunities and how we can maybe merge the two grant programs or go through a CIG and then and spur some ideas for potential implementation projects down the road. And that's all I have, thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer and Kelly. Um, for information about both of those funding opportunities. And we'll hold questions for them. I see that we have one in the chat box and we will um, move on over to um, David Gibson who joins us from GIFA to talk with us about their portfolio of funding opportunities. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, I think you should be able to see it now. Seeing it? Yes, you're all, all right. clear. I hear you uh, very well. All right, great. Uh, again, I'm David Gibson. I'm the Water Division Director here at GFA. I may have known you, some of you in the past in my other role. Uh, as of a couple of months ago, I moved over from being the Energy Division Director to, to Water. So uh, I want to today give you a bit of an overview of GFA, talk a little bit about our different funding programs, a little bit about the infrastructure act funds that we're anticipating and excited about. And uh, finally discuss our call for projects process and how a borrower can become eligible for principal forgiveness in our programs. So I will start with a quick overview of GFA and starting here. So we were founded in 1985. Uh, we facilitate programs that can serve and protect Georgia's energy, land, and water resources. 
DUFA provides loans for water, wastewater, solid waste infrastructure, manages energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, administer land conservation loans, and manages and monitors state-owned fuel storage tanks as well. To date, GIFA has funded over 1,900 projects and has provided more than 4.6 billion in low interest loans to cities, counties, and infrastructure authorities for improvements to water, wastewater, and solid waste systems. The Energy Resources Division, the division I used to be the director of, uh, promotes energy efficiency, renewable energy, energy assistance programs, and improve the environment, strengthen quality of life, and stimulate economic development and growth. Chief promotes energy conservation and the development of renewable energy sources through several energy programs. Um, the Weatherization Assistance Program is one that provides assistance to eligible house, households, low-income households in all of Georgia's counties. It provides free energy conservation measures um, installed in their homes. Uh, with, an, with an energy audit as well. Uh, so it's one of the energy programs. Another is energy performance contracting, where we work with uh, state-owned facilities, larger facilities to uh, create long-term savings um, and through long-term um, contracting. So up to 10, 15 years in most cases where the energy efficiency measures um, are paid for through the savings over those, over those years. So that's all financed in a, in a package of energy conservation measures. Um, the Energy Assurance Program works closely with GEMA and other state agencies, uh, FEMA as well, and private sector stakeholders to develop energy emergency planning resources and then also to lead exercises designed to ensure better emergency coordination, especially during hurricanes uh, or um, uh, ice storms, power outages of all kinds, and as well, um, fuel, fuel storage shortages that we may have that can also be created from hurricanes, for example, affecting the Gulf. Um, and another program, the Fuel Storage Tank Program, provides we provide oversight and monitoring uh, services for 463 fuel storage tanks at 23 different state agencies. So I will move on to the Water Resources Division. Um, we support the development of water, wastewater, and solid waste infrastructure projects, help, helping to protect the environment, facilitate economic development, accommodate population growth, and safeguard public health. The rest of this presentation um, will be focused on programs managed by the Water Resources Division. So first of all, who's eligible? Uh, this shows this slide shows the entities that can borrow from GFA. They're local governments, municipal corporations, county or local water, sewer, or sanitary districts, state or local authorities, boards, political subdivisions, and non-governmental entities, so NGOs whose primary mission is land conservation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our different financing programs. Um, we have two primary funding sources, so it's state and federal. The state-funded program is the Georgia Fund, and the federal-funded program is the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, or CWSRF, and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, the DWSRF. The Georgia Fund program can fund water, sewer, stormwater, solid waste, and solar projects. Um, it's usually reserved for projects that are not eligible for the other two programs, for example, emergency loans or drinking water economic development projects, uh, solid waste facilities, reservoirs, dams. Um, the interest rate for a 20 year loan in this program is 1.67% with a, a 3 million per year borrowing cap. The uh, SRF funds have federal requirements such as the state environmental review process, uh, Davis Bacon, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, and American Iron and Steel. The, the SRF program also has principal forgiveness opportunities, and the interest rate for a 20-year loan is 1.13% with a $25 million per year uh, program cap. The uh, Clean Water SRF funds sewer, stormwater, solar, and land conservation projects. 
the DWSRF on solar and water projects, as long as the primary purpose is to facilitate compliance with national primary drinking water regulations or advance the public health objectives of the state safe clean uh, drinking water act. Some of our interest rates, our current interest rates are shown here and therefore all three of the funding sources. If the project has a conservation component, then the interest rate is reduced. And I'll spend a little time discussing um, those eligible components for the reduced interest rate now in the following slides. These were always available on our website, so I'm just gonna go quickly past this one. Um, conservation initiative. We finance water conservation projects in the area of utility water loss and in-use water efficiency. In this case, a 1% interest rate reduction is available on water conservation loans made from the Georgia Fund, the Clean Water or Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Examples of water conservation projects include replacement and repair of leaking water lines, installing automatic meter reading systems or automatic metering infrastructure, uh, those that help eliminate line breaks through pressure management and installing high efficiency fixtures. Examples of energy conservation projects include alternative energy production projects at wastewater or water treatment plants, energy conservation projects such as those that reduce the need for pumping and make operations more energy efficient. Project examples include inflow and infiltration reduction, elimination of pump stations and installing SCADA equipment. Third type of conservation projects are those that reduce non-point source pollution. So examples of projects that prevent uh, polluted runoff from reaching our waterways include those that conserve or stabilize land, uh, construct green infrastructure, or eliminate faulty septic systems. Um, another way that um, interest rate reductions uh, can be realized is within a couple of these projects um, that we have listed on this slide, Water First and Plan First. Water First is a designation for local governments that demonstrate a commitment to responsible water stewardship for environmental and economic benefits. And uh, if, you, if you'd like, we can check that link. Um, it will be provided with the slides to gather more information about that. Um, we've also offered a number of webinars that are on our website about the Water First program. And then the Plan First program is through the Department of Community Affairs to recognize and reward communities that clearly demonstrate an established pattern of successfully implementing their local comprehensive plan. So these also receive a 1% uh, interest rate reduction. And just real quickly, um, we will sometimes get projects that um, they are not 100%, you know, conservation projects. And uh, for those projects, we will do our best to try to create a blended interest rate that would uh, have an interest rate reduction for the components of the project that are conservation. Uh, we are currently in our call for projects period. So it opens September 1st. 2021 closes uh, February 28, 2022. And um, this is the process time frame where we are determining uh, which projects can be eligible for principal forgiveness um, based on a scoring system that I'll talk about here on the next slide. Um, presented here are the 10 affordability criteria we use to score each community for principal forgiveness. Uh, for each criteria, the community receives a score between one and four based on where they fall within the quartiles, and this would give a maximum score of, of 40 points. And this affordability score, along with the project score, are both considered when allocating the principal forgiveness funds. Uh, I'm going to forego some of the specifics on the project criteria and just talk a little, this is my contact information, and just talk briefly about the Infrastructure Act and what we're seeing there for, for water and sewer projects. Um, I guess the short way to put it is everything I just said will be on steroids, right? So probably two, two and a half times more uh, of the funding that we currently have. Um, since the federal funding is $43 billion 
nationally in the Infrastructure Act for the programs that I mentioned, the, clean, the combination of those, the clean water, the drinking water, SRF programs. And within those two programs, there will be a couple of, of sub-programs that are significant as well. Um, there's a lead remediation in service lines component um, that is uh, very significant as a part of this. And then also emerging contaminants remediation component, which is um, currently targeting, which could change some currently targeting, targeting PFOS and PFOA. So there's stain resistance, waterproofing chemicals that have, are very persistent and ended up in our, in our waterways and uh, drinking water and wastewater. And, also from like non-stick non -stick coating material. So there's targeted funds toward um, reducing emergency, emerging contaminants and, and lead in, in service, drinking water service lines. Um, in addition to the uh, programs that I mentioned that were uh, clean water and drinking water state revolving fund programs. So they nationally 43 billion for that over five years. Um, so going through 2026. And then in um, the reauthorization of the clean water and drinking water SRF programs, that is a separate uh, 11 and a half billion over that same time frame, five years. Um, so we're excited about that. That's it's gonna mean some significant funding coming to Georgia and um, we'll be able to do a lot more good work with the communities in Georgia and uh, help to protect our waterways and our safeguard our drinking water systems. So with that, I'll stop and uh, my name and contact information should be up on your slide now. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, David. Uh, very much appreciate you running through those funding sources. And uh, we do have a few questions in the chat box uh, for Jill and uh, for, excuse me, for Jennifer and uh, Kelly. So I will uh, run back to those real quick. And if you have any questions for, um, for uh, David, please put those in the chat box as well. So we have one that I think was addressed in the chat. Um, Philip asked, can a property owned by a 501c3 homeowners association, if they team with a suitable organization, apply for the CIG? It involves saving tabby ruins that were the first rum distillery in Georgia. And um, Jennifer did reply that she thinks that there would be a way for the project to be eligible, possibly with a link to the local government or the BOE. And, um, and gave the contact information for reaching out. So I think we are probably all set on that request. And then we had another question that was sent to the hosts and panelists uh, section where, that said, why are uh, nonprofits ineligible for Clean Water Act 319 grants? That's not the case in other states and I'm curious about reasons. To which Kelly responded, um, I think Jane probably wasn't able to receive this. There are a couple of different channels for chat. So um, I, she said, I'm not sure how EPD established their eligible applicants. Joy Hinkle is the program manager, or you can contact their grants coordinator, Blue Coal. And um, I will cut and paste her uh, response into everyone. And if you have anything else that you would like to add for either one of those, Jennifer or Kelly, please feel free to come off mute and share additionally. I would just say with um, EPD funding, it's similar that, um, you know, if you have a nonprofit that's interested in partnering with an eligible applicant, that's a, usually a, an approach that we encourage for our coastal civil grants as well, so being um, an additional pass through um, applicant that way. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Anything further, Jennifer? Yeah, that's the same. I, I know there was an earlier question about homeowners associations, um, you know, applying for funds, and it's, it's the same with our coastal incentive grants. They can't um, directly apply for funds, but we have seen where there are projects in, you know, what we consider smaller communities where they just partner with their local government. Local governments are usually pretty willing to um, be the applicant on projects for smaller communities, such as, a, you know, a, a homeowners association, a neighborhood or a project like that. So um, I would highly encourage you to reach out to um, your contact there. I would also mention that uh, protection of a cultural resource is uh, with, a, with a living shoreline, specifically 
uh, bolstering against rising seas would be eligible under the National Coastal Resilience Fund with, a, with an appropriate applicant there as well. Um, while a homeowners association is a 501c3, it would uh, take some significant grant management that might be helpful to have a, um, a co-applicant with that capability already in-house. Any questions for David? Great, well, thank you uh, to Kelly, Jennifer, and David for that look at state funding resources. And I just wanted to um, take a minute to bring us to a close. I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer Klein for a few uh, wrap up items and next steps. Jennifer? Thanks, Lindy. Um, I, I, this has just been a wonderful, um, I think, opportunity and webinar and, you know, in the past, um, those of us who work on coastal resiliency, it's, we've always, you know, been harping on, um, there's always been a need or a gap for funding projects um, and opportunities to be able to, to reach out to that funding. Um, and now that's really not going to be necessarily the case for a little while. And so we have a huge opportunity in the state of Georgia to really um, bring those um, ideas and those plans forward. Um, you know, reach out to the partners who you have heard from today, um, who are also um, on this on this webinar, and just you know, have that contact with each other and on some of these projects. There's a, a wide array of partners. There's opportunities to leverage your resources, um, utilize these match opportunities. You know, now more than ever. Um, we do have, as Jill mentioned in the beginning, um, a community of practice, a coastal hazards community of practice. Um, if you're, are, you are interested in joining that, we meet quarterly, please reach out um, to myself, jennifer.klein at um, dnr.ga.gov or Jill Gamble with Georgia Sea Grant. Um, we are the hosts for that um, group. Um, we can share that information amongst each other. We can talk about projects. Um, and we would love to add you to our list, sir. Jill also mentioned this is just part one of, a webin of our webinar series. And um, you, since you already are on here and you stayed in tune with this project, these um, webinars will um, invite you to join part two of our webinar. Um, and we are also planning a in-person workshop um, so we can help maximize the resiliency for our state and um, our coast. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And we really um, look forward to partnering with you on future projects. So thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers for sharing such great information on funding opportunities in Justice 40 today. And thank you to all of our participants. Um, I also wanted to extend thanks to the Georgia Hazards Community of Practice and the steering committee who's working to host this resilience conversation. Much appreciation to all involved and uh, I appreciate your time today. Thanks.